on the forming edge of our lives, to resist the headlong tumble into the next moment, until we claim for ourselves awareness and gratitude, taking the time to look into one another's faces and see their communion, the reflection of our own eyes. This house of laughter and silence, memory and hope, is hallowed by our presence together. of memory, the neurologic process of remembering, as being similar to an overgrown trail. If you don't think of something very often, the memory gets dim. The same way weeds crowd against the edges of an unused path, or branches grow across a trail. But if you focus on something, like a song you knew as a kid, you can reopen the pathway and retrieve the memory, maybe not all at once, but eventually. But memory might also be compared to a scar. The more frequently you re-injure something, the more vividly the scar stands out, as the body is unable to erase all the evidence of damage. So who am I? I'm a mess of overgrown trails and livid scars, and clear garden paths. But I'm probably not the only one. So who am I? I am walking through waist-high ferns in the green light under redwood trees. I am sitting in the Quaker meeting house where all the seats face the center of the room and the spirit moves the heart to speak. I am playing in the rose garden and climbing the apricot tree and the fig trees. I am climbing out the attic window, don't tell my parents, <laughs> and watching the sun set into the ocean. I am saying no and not being heard. I am singing with my mother's family at a family reunion, as I have loved you, love one another, and knowing they believe with all their hearts. I am lying in tall grass on a golden hill under a blue sky. I am sharing silence with my father in a flickering firelight. I am driving through the dark on a summer night that smells of honeysuckle. I am coming out to my grandmother and hearing her say, she loves me. I am mourning for Columbine High School the month before I graduate. I am watching towers fall. I am learning about broken hearts and broken trust. I am moving out while he's at work so he won't hit me. I am holding my daughter for the first time and recognizing her spirit. I'm falling in love. So who am I? Since I was young, I felt the presence of something holy in so many places and in so many people that it seemed very silly to try to constrain it to a single body or being. I always kind of thought of God as a sort of spiritual Dungeons and Dragons 20-sided die that shows you the face you need, or maybe the one you expect. But love was always a very big part of that. So who am I? I'm learning how to be a more loving person, a more kind person. I'm learning how to be fierce when I need to be. I'm learning that there's a difference between forgetting 
and letting go. I'm learning that I'm a survivor even if I don't choose to relive my bad days over and over again. I'm learning that my worth does not diminish if I choose to try to let go when memory has served its purpose, nor does it diminish if I do not choose this. And I'm learning how to turn the fire in my heart into the warmth of love, the light of truth, and the energy of action go out. Who else am I? I am taking my children on a trip to and through my childhood, knocking on the door of the house I grew up in and showing them the room that was mine, camping in the redwoods, driving through those golden hills, and more, telling them stories I was told, living in their memories, leaving paths in their minds that they can find again later, where they will find the strength to let scars fade, and they will find love and light and action when they need it. Morning. Uh, when Craig Stiles asked me to speak to memory, which is the focus of the month of November, I thought to describe my experience and memories and personal experiences, further memories, future memories, I guess, and they have an impact on me. Memories are always shaping my beliefs and thus the development of spiritual views. As a youth in an Episcopal church, I can recall stories and parables honoring strength, wisdom, and bravery. Sounds familiar. This, I feel, gives me a foundation to begin my spiritual journey. Intentionally, stories and memories of place and people meet with a rich background, and this is who I am. Though the experience was more than just a couple of years ago, these stories and simple songs of that church shape a youthful character. While writing out, I visited this, I visited the dictionary and found that memory has its root in Latin, memora, and memor. Mindful remembering, definition one the power act, or process of recalling to mind facts previously learned, or past experiences. This according to Webster's New World Dictionary. As I look back at me as a six-year-old making pilgrim, a pilgrim couple out of the toilet paper rolls, I could see a people simply searching to worship with freedom guaranteed and safe from persecution. I figured that the harvest they were thankful for was so much more than food. Being separated by a few hundred years and a different faith tradition does not erase the similarity of their compact and their need for governance and our Unitarian principles and the adherence to the democratic process. Anyway, I'm not saying that our principles are descended from theirs, as we have a different narrative. Simply the memory of learning of their traditions later made me receptive to ours. Be it voting on election day or at an annual meeting, our annual meeting, we are doing something that our forebears and others hold as a sacred duty. I guess crafting paper pilgrims are a powerful, as powerful for me as a memory in that they are so powerful for me as a memory in that they shape my philosophy. Another reference found in this entry was plastic memory. 
plastic memory is also known as elastic memory. As an example, in a hardened spring, has greater plastic memory than, say, a cooked spaghetti noodle. Now, how to express this concept as it relates to a spiritual practice? To me, in the current atmosphere of bending of civility on the political scene and tolerance and the respect that has been being pushed to extremes, the preferred norm is to not exceed the elastic memory of civility. One would be hopeful that it would motivate people to work through disagreement and maintain social stability, keeping society on a stable path. We are all dependent on this expectation for safety of life, justice, and our social health. So civility can spring back to usefulness and purpose, or if we allow things to get out of hand for too long, have the appeal of an overcooked noodle. So I guess I'm saying that systems, methods, and even philosophy have elastic memory. If we give, if we have negative forces applied to them and they are not resilient enough, after a while, either long or short term, they will be compromised. We, as a caring society, can counter the negative force and maintain balance and keep health, the healthy things in equilibrium. When driving your car on the roadway, aside from the complicated physics that is involved, we have a legal speed limit. This limit could also be considered plastic. I can choose to guide my car with care and maintain a legal speed. I would get better fuel economy as one result. Having seen the results of traffic accidents, I particularly don't want to be party to one. If I am driving in this way, as I am working to stretch the elastic memory of driving in a direction better for us all, I want, as I want to minimize harm and the potential for an accident. And this would be also I would also be a good steward of the environment. Now, if I am breaking the speed limit law because I need to get a critical, critical family member to the emergency room, or I am late for work and will lose my job if I am late one more time, I really may not want to receive a citation, but I'm willing to risk that. But I might be headed for trouble. Circling back to elastic memory or being safe and looking out for the safety of others. I have this memory of driving a car too fast and it is stressful. And personally, I don't think it's in keeping with nurturing the, with nurturing the independent web of all existence, which I would like to remain a part for a little while longer. A terrible memory. If you tell me something, there is a 99.9% .9 chance I will forget it in about five minutes. This really becomes a problem when it is something important, like scheduling meetings or asking me to do something, like writing a talk on memory, for example. Yep, totally forgot. And not even just once. Craig, my ever patient husband, reminded me that I'm speaking today no less than four times. At least I think he reminded me that many times. It might have been more, but if he did, I forgot. <laughs> to be honest, my short-term my short term memory is really the problem. I've always prided myself on having an excellent long-term memory. But here is something interesting. I recently read an article that stated that our memories are more like photocopies of events that happened. And every time you remember something, you are basically rewriting that memory. Eventually, the details become a little hazy. We start adding or removing little bits here and there 
until eventually we may have a completely different memory. But to us, it may seem correct. Meanwhile, another person present at the same event might remember things very differently. This is why I always get into a huge argument with my mom over what really happened at the last time we get together. So, if our memories are always changing, how can we preserve the integrity of all the important moments in our lives? Fortunately, in this age of information, recording a memory is super easy. Take a picture or a video, take notes, keep a journal. I think most of you know that I have been a professional photographer for about the past 13 years or so. It is something I have always been super passionate about. Well, me and about 10,000 other people with a camera, but we all have a passion. But what am I really passionate about? Sure, the creativity is lots of fun and a great fun outlet, but for me, there is something more important than even the art. I photograph a lot of weddings, newborns, and families. That's because I feel strongly that these are what we need to remember the most. Take a newborn, for example. Imagine those tiny little fingers, those long lashes, chubby cheeks, a little curl on their head, that tiny bit of fuzz on their ear. There is almost nothing you can't love about a baby. But all those wonderful little details start to fade from our minds. And babies grow so fast. Today you are bringing them home from the hospital. It feels like you have years and years ahead of you until one day your baby goes off to college and you look back and realize just how quickly time can fly. All the little clothes, the toys, the must-have gadgets that you thought would make your life easier, those are packed away or sold. All you have left are the memories. And isn't it wonderful that we live in a time where it is so easy to capture every special moment? Anyone with a halfway decent cell phone can record photo and video. We can share those online and caption it all. We can even have those images and words printed in books and kept forever. How amazing is that? There's another reason to record your memories. Five years ago, my dad passed away. For his funeral, I was tasked with collecting all the pictures of him I could find and putting, to, putting them all together in a video montage. After talking to everyone in the family and collecting as much as I could, we still only found less than 100. In fact, it was far less than that. My dad hated to have his picture taken. He always felt awkward in front of the camera. So now we only have one little box to help us remember all the times we had together. A few photos that I can look and see pieces of myself reflected there, or remember events I only have a vague recollection of. Most of what I have are photos of him when he was younger, so they aren't even my own memories. But I'm certainly glad to have them. In fact, while I was preparing for this particular talk, I was looking at all of those photos of my dad, and I noticed there was a picture of him when he was really young, maybe about two years old, and he was smiling. And when I saw that smile, I thought, oh my goodness, that's my son. I could see my son's smile reflected in a photo of my dad. I had more of those moments recorded. I have a lot of great memories, but as I mentioned before, the details are becoming a little fuzzy. I'm not sure sometimes if what I remember is actually true or something my mind made up to fill in the blanks. Something I have heard over and over is, I don't feel like having my picture taken. Most often, it's for women who feel they are not that perfect image of beauty. So they let all the moments pass them by. Nothing gets recorded because they don't feel they are worth remembering. Well, 
let me tell you something. You are worth remembering. Someday, you won't be here. Maybe that sounds morbid, but it's the truth. None of us live forever. And someone is going to want to look back and remember all of those amazing times that you spent together. They want to see you, and they want to know you, no matter what you looked or felt like at that moment. They want to know that you were present. They want to know you were real. So, be in the photo. Write in the journal. Make sure that the ones you love have a way to remember you. And be sure to take lots of photos of the ones you love along the way. So you can always look back and remember those happy times together. Or all the fun details that are so easily forgotten. Thank you.